Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santinetti, and my wife and I are here, hopefully every morning, by God's grace, to be here to share the Word of God with you. Today we're looking at the last piece of the armor, and we've been talking about it is custom made for you. <laughs> Woo. The custom made armor is for you. It's all about God giving you an armor that fits you perfectly. Mm-hmm. Remember, whoever puts on the armor of God, will find themselves in a constant battle against evil forces, the enemy. And so when you say, I'm putting on the armor of God, you need to be ready because there's going to be a fight. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, which is the foundation, basically, before we jump into the pool. It's, um, and it says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Notice, word of truth, power of God, armor of righteousness. Isn't, doesn't that flow beautifully? Look, I mean, look at the picture. The picture is beautiful. Come on. Word of truth, power of God, and the armor of righteousness. And God has given us an armor of righteousness. That is tailored for you. Every battle is tailored for you. You say, God, how come I got to go through this? Well, God has a purpose to teach you something, but you know, the last part of this armor, a lot of people say for a long time, six parts to the armor. Well, uh, Revelation is progressive, and people have um, come to understand that it's one more piece that people give up on because they don't see it. Well, many people have seen it, and so today we're talking about the javelin of prayer. You said the javelin of prayer. Yes, the Roman soldier had a a small sword, face-to-face combat, but they also had a javelin that they used to throw in the air, and it was important. So now let's look at the scriptures that we're dealing with. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, these three verses of scripture is the last piece of the armor, the javelin. The javelin of prayer it's awesome because no matter where you're at, you can launch um, you can launch your javelins because they go way beyond you. That's why I said even the weakest Christian on their back can defeat the enemy because they have javelins. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can throw javelins from your bed, from your chair, in your bathtub. It doesn't matter where you are. If it comes to mind, throw a javelin at it. Because God hears your prayer. Now, what's interesting is that many commentators, many commentators agree. The last weapon is prayer. And it takes all sorts of prayer, mental and vocal, public and private, and every branch of it to make it happen. Now, understand that the prayer closet is a place of formation. And you say, how is that? Well, very simple. Formation represents the structure and the arrangement of something. That's what the word means. But where there is truth, there is structure and principles of that truth. So we learn the structure of principles of the word of God, and we begin to pray nothing like praying the word of God. Madam Gu Young took care of that in a very simple book called... um, uh, the in the inward parts of Christ or something. No, I forgot the name. Oh man, help me! But look up Madame Guyong on prayer, and she she brings it in the depths of Christ. That's what it's called, the depths of Christ. And um, I I read that book when I was a young Christian, and I became a little afraid because it took me deep into prayer, and I didn't understand it. But I tell you, I understand it now. Now the next one, of course, the prayer closet is a place of concentration. What is concentration? Well. Action and power of focus. Meditation is the key in God's presence because we must be careful to not utter words that are empty. And you remember the movie um, um, War War Room, 
And this is the beautiful picture of this lady that prayed earnestly in the in the war room. And boy, that movie really moved my heart because if you want to see the power of prayer and you want to see how it works, these two ladies, man, they were warriors. They were warriors that knew how to pray. They knew, they knew how to pray. And so you see her petitions on the war. Let me tell you, her hand up represents that javelin. She had a javelin in her hand. She was throwing javelins. Oh, hallelujah. I love that. So focus, focus. Now, every religion prays. It is the lifeline and strength of the mind and the heart. And we're going to touch on that one later on in a few minutes and because I want to share something about that. But the great deterrence against evil movement is prayer. You see, God's principles of prayer established in the first sanctuary in the desert. This is where it happened. The first sanctuary in the desert was the tabernacle of Moses and God's principal prayers was established there. The principle of prayer was established there in the desert. Can you imagine that? Boy, you know, if you want to learn how to pray, get in the desert. I went through my desert times many times, and God showed me something about prayer. Well, in the tabernacle sanctuary, there were three items before the Ark of the Covenant that God told Moses to make. And let's look at them. It says that there was the lamp stand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. As I was preparing this this morning, uh, it was I was very, I'm very familiar with the with the um, the tabernacle of Moses. I've been studying it for over 30 years, and God has given me many truths. So I I was able to. Well, it came back to mind, and I said, yes. If you look at this picture, this is pretty much the arrangement when you went into the sanctuary, the tabernacle of Moses. Remember, remember you had the outer court, then you had the inner court, the sanctuary part, where only the priests were able to go in and the high priest once a year. And two, if you look at it, to your left, you had the lampstand, that had to be put, that had to, uh, uh, the priest had to put oil in it to keep the fire burning. That gave light to the showbread on the right, but right in the middle, right before the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was, that is the, in, the altar of incense. And this is the principle of prayer, praise, and fragrance. Now, behind the veil that separated the three was the Ark of the Covenant. And we see the covenant, the altar of incense was right before the veil. Now, God told him, God established the principle of prayer in the tabernacle of Moses by instructing Moses to build an altar, to build an altar. And this altar is called the altar of incense. Notice that, the altar of incense. Now, let me share something beautiful about this. You see the way it looks. It is is actually incense coming out from the top because it had to have fire on it. They would put incense into the little bowl there on top of the lid of the altar. And actually, it's one piece. And you see there are four horns there. Now, four horns represent strength, but it also represents the four corners of the earth. Mm. Now, notice that there's incense. Now, watch this. They would put incense in that bowl, and then they had to put fire on it. But remember, there was they didn't light matches or anything like that. What the high priest or the priest had to do is actually a high priest. They had to take fire from the sacrifice outside, which is the sacrifices where they used to sacrifice the bulls and the animals for sin. They would take some of that fire every morning and place it upon the, the incense in the bowl and it would burn and the incense would go through the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was Mm -hmm. and God was pleased with that incense. That's why when you read, it says that the that the altar was placed before the veil. But when you go to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, and it talks about this piece, it says that this piece was behind the veil. And I used to say, wait a minute, how could it be behind when in Exodus, it says it was before, because I understood that the incense went through the veil to where God was 
in the on the on the Ark of the Covenant. And folks, your body is that altar of incense. I'm going. I'm going ahead of myself. And from this body flows the fragrance of our praise and prayer to God in heaven. Well, okay. <laughs> so behind the veil that separated the ark, the uh, the ark of the covenant from the veil was, uh, excuse me, the ark of the covenant from the altar of incense was a veil. Now I want you to see because God told him to make something. And he said, you are to make an altar for burning incense. You are to make it of acacia wood. Now understand, acacia wood is also called in the Bible, incorruptible wood. You say, how are we going to bring this to the end to Ephesians? I'm going to show you how. I'm going to show you how. Now notice he says, you're to make it of acacia wood. You say, wood? Why? Because this wood is called incorruptible wood, and it represents, number one, the incorruptible nature of Christ. Mm -hmm. Wood represents man here. The incorruptible wood represents God-man, which is Christ. But watch this. You're to make it of acacia wood, incorruptible wood. Prayer, the prayers of the saints are incorruptible before the presence of God. Because we pray in the name of Jesus and through the Messiah, it is incorruptible prayer. It is pure unto the ears of God. So let's go to the next verse, verse 2, and it says, It is to be a square one and a half feet long and one and a half feet wide, and it is to be three feet high with its horns of one piece with it. Notice that the height of it is higher than anything else. Although it is squared around, it had to be high. Why? Because our prayers go much further than where we are. Our prayers go high into the very throne room of God. But watch this. The horns had to be of one piece because God wants prayer from all the earth as one. God hears his church as one. Everyone prays, but everyone who prays in the ears of God, it is one. Because God is one God. One, but listen, we have one faith, one spirit, one father, one Lord, one baptism. And it is overlaid, watch this with something very special that God said to do. So remember, the horns had to be upon the top, right where the incense is. Now he said in verse 3, you are to overlay it with pure gold, its top, its sides all around, and its horns, and you are to make a molding of gold all around it. Now think about this. God said, take that wood, and I want you to put it, I want you to make uh, uh, sheets of gold, and I want you to wrap it around this piece. Why? Because gold represents God. It represents the purity of God. Now watch this now. This altar of incense had to be wrapped completely with gold, hiding the wood that was inside of it. The Bible tells us that Jesus the God-man, the incorruptible man, came to earth, but he is God. But it also represents that our prayers are so precious to God as gold, incorruptible. Why? Because it is God, through the Holy Spirit, praying through us. And listen to this. It was, it was interesting. It had to be overlaid, but then he said you had to make a molding around it, a crown. It was a crown. You see, prayer is the crown of the Christian because Christ is the king of our lives. He is the king and the Lord of our lives. And he says, make a crown. Why? Because your prayers are a crown to me. Your prayers are a fragrance that goes into my nostrils, if you want to put it that way. And God says, it's a sweet-smelling aroma. Why? Because... Christ is our fragrance. Now, verse 4, you are to make two gold rings for it under its molding. Watch this. You are to make them on two poles, on two, excuse me, on, uh, on its two opposite sides, and they are to be holders for poles by which to carry it. Very important. This also had to be done of the Ark of the Covenant, they had to be poles because no man can touch it. Notice it was under 
the mold, the crown that the poles were. Why? Because when we carry the the altar of incense, we have to remember that we are below the crown. Christ is the king, but it is to be carried. Look at verse 4. He says, you are to make two gold rings for each side so that the poles go into. Now, let me tell you something about these rings. This is very powerful. The rings represent marriage. It, re it represents eternal, eternity. Prayer is the marriage of the heart with God. When you pray, you are so intimate with God that he considers it to be marriage. We are married to him. Aren't we not the bride of Christ? That's why the first altar of prayer we see in the Bible is Adam. Because God blew his breath, watch this now, he blew his breath into the nostrils of Adam, he became a living soul. Do you know that the altar of incense represents the soul of man? Because this is where praise, prayer, and the fragrance of our communication goes to God from the heart, but it is the soul. Now watch this now. When he breathed into Adam, please pay attention, he breathed the power of life, but also the power of communication because it would be into this pure soul that God would speak to him and he would speak to God. That's why in the cool of the day, they would have communication. It was a time of communication. Prayer is nothing more than talking communication with God. And anybody can do it from anywhere. He said, you are to make two gold rings for it under its mold. You are to make them on the two opposite sides, and they are to be holders for the poles by which you carry. And those poles represent our burden. We need to carry prayer. Verse 5, you are to make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Because we carry the, the very presence of God around in us, around us. Everywhere we go, the presence of God is there with us. We're carrying the burden of God's, of God's love for this world, and that's why we pray. Okay, verse 5, uh, 6. You are to put the altar in front, of the, uh, in front of the curtain that is over the ark, watch this, of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. The, once a year, remember, the priest used to go in there to make atonement for the sin of Israel. I know I get excited, but there's so much food. And it was here that he first had to put incense to burn so that the fragrance went into the holy place so that when he walked in, it would be a sweet-smelling aroma and the priest would put the blood on the mercy seat and God would talk to him there. He would meet with him there between the cherubims. I will meet with you. I will talk to you. And we see something happening here with Christ, which we're going to talk about, because Christ went into that holy place the day that he died on the cross. And he said, it is finished. And the Bible says he breathed, notice, he breathed his last, the Bible tells us. In other words, he let out the last breath of his soul. What was he doing on the cross? Talking to to the Father. He breathed out his last prayer when he said, into your hands I commend my spirit. He blew out his soul. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help me God. He blew out his last breath and went into the temple and ripped the very veil in the temple that we might go in and breathe with him. That's why prayer is so Awesome, because we are breathing with Christ. We are talking with him out of our souls. The very breath of our souls are talking to him. And watch this. We are over that mercy seat with him because he has placed his own blood upon us. His mercy is upon us. And that's why we can meet with him and commune with him between the cherubim. Now, verse 7, Aaron is to offer fragrant incense on it every morning when he trims the lamp he is to offer it. I want to share something very special. You see this picture here? He had to trim the lamp. Another word for it in the Hebrew is dress it. 
to dress the lamp. I want to share the ancient Hebrew word about trim or dress this lamp, this altar. He had to trim it. Wow. Every morning when he trims the lamps, he had to offer, watch this, he had to trim the lamp, and this word trim is the word tab, which means good. And it's the picture of a basket and a tent, meaning that when you put these two words together, it is surround the house, and the house was surrounded by grace, beauty, love, health, prosperity, and everything that is functionable. Notice that prayer, in, the, in that very sanctuary with the light and the showbread, it is good. It is pleasant. It is the house that's surrounded by grace. That's why prayer must be trimmed every morning as we read the light, the word of God. That's how you trim your lamp. Sometimes you say, I don't know what to pray. Open the word of God and pray the word. That's how you trim your prayer and your lamp. And the Bible tells in verse 8, and when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, this is right before, listen, right before, right before the night ends. He is to offer it as a continual incense offering to the Lord's presence throughout your generations. Prayer, he said, I want you to pray. And I want prayer to go up from this temple for eternity. That's why Every morning and every evening and even throughout the day, the Jews pray the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord, the God, the Lord is one. That's the Shema. Every morning, he says, you are not to offer strange incense, a burning offering or a grain offering on it, nor are you to pour out a libation on it. Remember I told you about all religions pray. But this is the only place that God says, I will hear your prayer. I will commune with you right here. Let me tell you something. Whether it be Buddhism or every other religion that is outside of Christ, they do not pray into the very throne room of God. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, Amen. the truth, and the life, and no one Nothing can come before the Father except it goes through me. I want to let you know that there are people out there, that's right, pastors and ministers who are preaching universalism. Universalism is basically the doctrine that God hears the prayers of all the religions of the world and somehow, some way, they're going to make their way to God. We have one pastor that backslid after he had a, a congregation of about 5,000 people and God was using them, backslid into this era. His name is Carton Pearson. Watch him. And I don't mean go and watch him. Watch the stuff he say. He has become a very strong New Age philosopher, and he preaches what is called the gospel of inclusion, meaning that everyone is included in the gospel, and somehow, some way, they're going to find themselves to God. That everyone one way or another, is going to come through Jesus Christ. Folks, that is strange fire before God. And the two sons of Aaron did it, and God burned them in his very presence. He killed them because of it, because he didn't go. They didn't go with the authority of the high priests. They went around it. And they didn't, t watch this, the reason that God killed them is because they did not take fire from the altar where they sacrificed the animals, they brought in their own fire to put on the altar of incense, and God killed them. He burned them up. He burned them up because they said, he said, I don't under, he said, I do not undertake this fire. I will not accept this fire because you didn't go through the altar. The altar represents the very cross of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, praying with all kinds of prayers. But it was not just prayers. It had to be done in the name of Jesus. Now, last verse on this particular part. Each year, Aaron is to make atonement on its horns with the blood of the sin offering of the atonement. This is to make atonement on it each year throughout your generations. It is 
most holy to the Lord. We're going to continue this because we're going to talk about what happens in this time of atonement and how it's all connected to Jesus and the, and the cross and the saints of God. Oh, I, please don't miss this. God willing, we'll be here tomorrow unless I go with the Lord and you'll be here tomorrow. Don't miss this because it is important and we're going to bring this thing home. Why? We are to pray with all prayers and supplications. As Paul said, the seventh piece of the armor makes it happen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, spirit-filled day. Amen.